Hello and welcome back to the part 2 of our impaired clotting disorders video on BunMed. In the last video we talked about the issues with impaired clotting in terms of primary hemostasis, focusing mainly on von Willebrand factor and as well as that things like uh, thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura and hemolytic uremic syndrome. In this video we're going to be looking at the second part of primary hemostasis and that of the platelets. Now I'd really recommend before getting into this video to have a look at that video first as we really understand the huge role that von Willebrand plays in clotting and what happens if we don't have enough of it. Now with that said let's get into platelet disorders. So before we understand the disorders of the platelet let's have a look at the normal life cycle of a platelet first. So where does it all start? Well, it all starts at the liver with the production of a protein known as thrombopoietin. Thrombopoietin then travels to the bone marrow and it causes hematopoietic stem cells to go down the myeloid route and produce lots and lots of these purple cells known as megakaryocytes. The megakaryocytes then swell up, burst and release platelets into our circulation. These circulating platelets have a shelf life of around 10 days before they are finally broken down by the spleen. Now, if we backtrack and see where things can go wrong, we can see that if we don't have uh, enough thrombopoietin, we might not have enough platelets because we won't be telling anyone to make them. So what could cause a reduction in thrombopoietin levels? Well, any damage or insult to the liver could cause an issue with thrombopoietin, and these include things like liver cirrhosis, where we have a fatty, dysfunctional liver, or excessive alcohol intake, which might lead to liver cirrhosis. Then we could have an issue with the production factory of our platelets, our bone marrow. And things for this include things that infiltrate the bone marrow, so things like leukemia or myelodysplasia, which is uh, the precursor to leukemia. However, we haven't met the cell count to be uh, classified as leukemia. We could have things like a lymphoma, where we have a cancer of our lymph nodes, and this overspills into the blood and infiltrates our bone marrow. We could have things like myeloma, where we have a cancer of our plasma cells inside of our bone marrow. And finally, we could have a scarring of the bone marrow matrix in a condition known as myelofibrosis. Now, to find out a bit more about leukemia and myelodysplasia, I would recommend checking out the leukemia video as this uh, goes through exactly the cell lineages and how they arise. Other things that we might have is things like aplastic anemia, where we have uh, an infection and we're born with uh, some kind of bone marrow disorder where all of our uh, cell lineages are not being functional. And the last thing is if we don't have the substances to form our uh, platelets and form our cells, including things like B12 and folate, then we're not going to be able to form our platelets. Now, the next thing might be an issue with the platelets themselves. Say, for instance, if we had an immune attack or antibodies against our platelets in the case of idiopathic or immune thrombocytopenic purpura or ITP, our platelets tend to get attacked by our own immune system. Another thing that could happen is iatrogenic, where we give a medication to our patients, which causes them to de develop uh, antibodies in things like heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, where the administration of heparin actually causes the breakdown of platelets. And we'll get into both of these conditions in the coming slides. We could also have an intrinsic issue with how the platelets interact with each other. So when the platelets are activated, they bind to each other using a receptor known as the GP2B3A. If that receptor is missing or that receptor is dysfunctional, then the platelets cannot bind. And this is a condition that we call Glanzmann's thrombasthenia. Another issue that could happen is our platelets have a very difficult time binding to von Willebrand factor using the GPA1B receptor. And this is what we call uh, bernard soulier syndrome. Now, these two conditions are rather uh, fine print, so don't worry hugely about these ones. The last thing that could happen is that we may have an overactive spleen, a very hungry spleen, which uh, eats a lot of our uh, platelets in something like hypersplenism. Now, let's get into a bit more about idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura. Idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura may also be called immune thrombocytopenic purpura. So therefore, we know that in some case, in some way, our immune system is involved. Thrombocytopenic refers to the fact that we're deficient in platelets. And purpura refers to a type of rash known as the purpuric rash, which is quite common in platelet uh, deficiencies. So how does it all start? Well, it all starts with our platelet. And we have uh, antibodies being formed against the platelet, specifically against our GP2B3A receptor. So here, it mainly occurs in children and those who are pregnant. So here you can see we have a platelet, and in blue we can see our GP2B3A receptor. In immune thrombocytopenic purpura, 
we have an antibody against our receptor. Now this antibody platelet complex is too large to pass through the spleen and therefore it's broken down. So therefore we end up having less platelets in our blood. So what sort of signs and symptoms might we see? Well, we might see in acute disease, things like it usually comes on after having a viral infection. And this is especially common in children who will have issues with, say, for instance, bru bruising or bleeding following a viral infection. Things like nosebleeds, because if we can't clot properly, we are a lot more likely to bleed from uh, exposed areas like our nose. Things like mucosal bleeding. So when we're brushing our teeth, we tend to bleed a lot from our gums purpuric rashes because we're not able to form the uh, initial platelet plug and therefore we get bouts of bleeding all over our body. Easy or spontaneous bruising, again for the exact same reason. And if we have this in a chronic condition, so this is when uh, the thrombocytopenia lasts for a long time, our spleen tends to eat more and more and more and more of our platelets, so therefore they actually tend to get splenomegaly. Okay, so what kind of investigations are we going to want to carry out? Well, again, from the name, we know that there's th thrombocytopenia going on. And from the symptoms, we can work out that there's some degree of issue with clotting. So the first thing that we're going to want to do is a full blood count. And the hallmark of ITP is this something that we call an isolated thrombocytopenia, meaning our other cell lineages, so that of our uh, hemoglobin and our white cells should not be affected. In fact, this is an effective way to potentially um, try to differentiate it on a blood count from something like leukemia, whereas often in leukemia we're going to see a raised white cell count and a low hemoglobin due to bone marrow infiltration. Whereas in ITP we tend to see only the platelets being involved and both the other parameters being fairly normal. The next thing we want to do is make sure this is a true thrombocytopenia. And the way we do this is by doing a blood film where we see fewer platelets in the blood film. Now we want to make sure there's nothing wrong with the signal that tells our bone marrow to make the platelets. And we do this by making sure that our liver is working normally using some liver function tests. One thing that may be associated with any immune disease and not just immune thrombocytopenic purpura is thyroid dysfunction. Because often uh, causes of hyper and hypothyroidism tend to be autoimmune in nature. So therefore we should rule them out using some TFTs. Another thing that may be associated with uh, idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura is an IgA deficiency. And although I haven't included it on the slides, it would be good to make sure that the IgA levels are normal because a low IgA level might hint that there's some degree of ITP going on. And the, the big thing to remember here uh, is that this is a disease of exclusion. So you have to rule out all the other conditions before you can uh, fully settle on ITP. Great, so what kind of treatment options are available for ITP? Well, usually ITP tends to be, in acute cases, a self-restricting condition. So therefore, we don't often have to use anything. It should resolve by itself in a few weeks. If this is per persisting past a few weeks, or say, for instance, the patient is getting significant bleeding, we can try to dampen down the immune response using IV corticosteroids. Now, corticosteroids are fantastic at dampening down most immune response diseases as they are very potent anti-inflammatories. Should this not work, we could potentially consider something like IV immunoglobulins to directly block the uh, circulating antibodies against our platelets. And if that doesn't work and the ITP has been going on for a long period of time, one way that we can reduce the number of platelets being broken down is by doing something called a splenectomy where we remove the spleen in the hopes that um, we are not breaking down as many platelets. Great, now let's have a look at an iatrogenic cause of a thrombocytopenia in the case of heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. So we know in this case we have something to do with the administration of the drug heparin, which leads to a deficiency of circulating platelets in our blood. Now, a thing to understand is that heparin often, and in most cases, has absolutely nothing to do with platelets. In fact, in a coming up video of focusing on the anti-clotting uh, anti drugs, I'll be talking about how heparin works. But often heparin works um, on the intrinsic pathway on a molecule known as antithrombin-3, the exact opposite of thrombin. So therefore, it shouldn't usually affect platelets. However, in heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, the heparin molecule does something odd. And it tends to bind onto this yellow thing that we can see called uh, platelet factor 4. And after this binds, we get the development of antibodies in our blood against the heparin and the anti platelet factor 4 antibodies, like so. And as such, in heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, 
we now have formation of antibodies against the platelet factor 4 and the heparin complex. And this usually occurs about 4 to 5 days after heparin exposure because we actually need time for our antibodies in our blood to actually develop onto what is perceived to be a new threat. Now, this, um, you'd often think, okay, well, that's not too big an issue because we saw in uh, ITP, surely the spleen would just clear it. We don't have to worry too much about it. But in actuality, what ends up happening is uh, once the antibody binds to this platelet factor for heparin complex, our platelets actually become activated. And from our previous videos, we actually know that an activated platelet does something very odd and it starts spewing out uh, other factors that go on to activate nearby platelets, things like thromboxane A2 and ADP, which causes nearby platelets to become activated and start to form clots all over the body. So this is looking a bit like um, TTP all over again, isn't it? Now, these lots and lots of clots that are forming can then get deposited in the venous system in places like our lungs and the pulmonary veins and give us something like a pulmonary embolism or deep vein thrombosis, the former being quite life threatening. In the arterial system, they might get deposited in places like the brain or even the heart, giving us things like a stroke or myocardial infarction. So this, is a, this isn't something that we can, you know, take uh, on the side. Uh, this is actually quite a serious condition. So what kind of symptoms are we going to see? Well, at the end of the day, it's very odd to actually have any kind of symptoms. So uh, patients often tend to be fairly asymptomatic and it's often picked up on a blood test four to five days after giving heparin. So this is usually seen in hospitalized individuals, those, so for instance, uh, waiting to undergo a surgery or an elective procedure who have been given heparin prophylactically. However, if, say, for instance, we do have a venous system involved in things like a DVT, we might see patients complaining of leg pain or leg heaviness. In the case that it gets uh, lodged in the pulmonary veins, we might get shortness of breath and pleuritic chest pain, as well as coughing up blood in a process known as hemoptysis. And this is the classic triad of uh, symptoms that really should point to the direction of a, a pulmonary embolism, as this can be very life-threatening. In the arterial system, if we have a, a clogging up one of our coronary arteries, we might get an MI or a heart attack, causing central chest pain, and this may radiate to the jaw or down our left arm. And in, uh, if we have uh, the clot being lodged in one of the vessels in our brain, we might get signs and symptoms of a stroke, so things like uh, acute onset weakness, issues with our speech, or issues with our vision as well. Okay, so what kind of investigations are we going to want to do? So the first thing, as I said, this is an asymptomatic condition usually. So therefore, the first thing we do is a full blood count. And a full blood count often shows a thrombocytopenia. In fact, it should be suspected in anyone who has recently received a thrombin, uh, sorry, heparin in the last couple of days. Now, in order to diagnose this and actually stratify the risk for it, we can use something known as the four T's criteria. The first T is the degree of thrombocytopenia. The second T is the timing of onset following the administration of a heparin. The third T is the presence of thromboses. And the fourth T is potentially other causes for the thrombocytopenia. Now, the reason I haven't included this in the slide is because this is quite specialist. So just knowing, though, um, that we do see a thrombocytopenia and the diagnosis uh, depends on its relation to when thromb uh, heparin was given is the most important thing here. The next thing that we can do is do an uh, HIT antigen assay, where we try to detect the presence of the antigens, where the uh, activated uh, heparin and platelet factor IV complexes in the blood. Now, this is a highly sensitive test, meaning that it will pick up most of the cases up to 99%, but it's not very specific, meaning that it has a high false positive rate. And in fact, in order to rule out the high posit uh, false positive rate, we can do something like a HIT functional assay where we see uh, the action of the antibodies against the platelet factor IV and heparin complexes. And of course, we want to fully investigate any of the complications of this condition. So things like DVT, PE, uh, MI and stroke. So for that, we might do things like for a PE, we might do a uh, usually a CTPA, which is CT pulmonary uh, angiogram. And this is uh, often done in most patients who uh, are, have no renal failure and are not pregnant because it uses contrast. But if they are pregnant or say, for instance, they have some kind of renal dysfunction, then we can do a VQ scan. In an MI or myocardial infarction, we can do some ECGs and troponin studies. And finally, for strokes, we can do a CT head. So how do we go about managing it? 
Well, we know that this is triggered by heparin. So the first thing to do immediately is to stop the uh, heparin as soon as possible. The second thing to do is to anticoagulate them because we don't want the formation of these clots all over our body. So we give a non-heparin uh, anticoagulant. So things like uh, direct direct oral anticoagulants, so things like apixaban, rivaroxaban, and dabigatrin, for instance. We may also use fondoparinu if fondoparinu isn't the thing that triggered it. And lastly, we may use something like argotroban. Now, just to let you know, I will be doing a video explaining exactly how the dough acts and how fondoparinu and the rest of them work, um, because it's way too much to cover in one video. Uh, but I will definitely do a video on its own going through the different anticoagulants and the different classes of anticoagulants. And lastly, a very important thing to remember for heparin-induced thrombocytopenia is not to use a vitamin K antagonist. And by this, I mainly mean warfarin, because using a vitamin K antagonist, there's a really high risk of uh, limb gangrene going on. So like skin necrosis. So that concludes our series on the primary hemostasis dis disorders. So we've looked at both the von Willebrands. Now we've looked at the platelet disorders, the big platelet disorders. Um, on the next video, we're going to be looking at issues with secondary hemostasis. So focusing mainly on hemophilia and also looking at what happens when both the systems go wrong in a condition known as DIC or disseminated intravascular coagulation. I will also make sure to include some exam style questions that we go through just to help consolidate some of the stuff that we've learned over the previous videos.